people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin the headlines first. India at UN Security Council expresses deep concern over civilian casualties in armed conflict. Bangladesh detains popular Islamic preacher in anti-terrorism case. And Indian security forces boss Pakistan sponsored narco terror module in Kashmir. India has always condemned the oppressive use of violence on civilian populations, regardless of who commits it. In the past also, New Delhi has expressed concern that very little is done to strengthen national and societal capacities of protection, while emphasizing that the protection of civilians in the conflicts is a primary responsibility of national governments, India recently in UN Security Council gave suggestions to strengthen peacekeeping missions. We we'll take a look. The world today is witnessing vicious cycles of violence with political, ideological, ethnic, religious and criminal motivations. The outbreaks in different parts of the globe have served as grim reminders of the international community's lack of meaningful progress to uphold their commitments to protect civilians in armed conflict. The deliberate targeting and collateral impact of conflicts on civilians results in long-term negative consequences for whole communities. Hence, the international community must meaningfully advance the protection of civilians, starting with a recommitment to the critical dictum of do no harm. Recently, at a UN Security Council debate on protection of civilians in armed conflicts, New Delhi highlighted that the onus of responsibility of protecting the civilians lies fundamentally with national governments. It is indeed disconcerting that civilians continue to be the primary victims of armed conflict. There can be no substitute for national efforts in creating an environment where civilians are secure while peacekeepers implementing Security Council mandates and humanitarian organizations delivering much-needed aid have an important role to play, the onus of responsibility for protecting civilians lies fundamentally with national governments. We cannot ignore the adverse impact of terror attacks in today's debate on protection of civilians. Terrorists and terror entities have significantly enhanced their capabilities by gaining access to new and emerging technologies which present us with new threats, including for civilian populations. Today, tens of thousands of young peacekeepers are deployed around the world and play a major role in helping the missions implement the mandated activities, including the protection of civilians. However, the ever-expanding mandates of peacekeeping missions with limited resources has added to the challenges and complexities that peacekeepers face on the ground. These challenges are compounded further by the increasing use of improvised explosive devices by terrorists and armed groups. Underlining the role of technology in the safety of UN peacekeepers, India has told the world body's top organ that plans are afoot to launch a mobile tech platform in August this year that will provide terrain-related information to the peacekeepers in the line of duty. Addressing the UN Security Council open debate on United Nations peacekeeping operations, improving safety and security of peacekeepers, Deputy Permanent Representative of India to UN K. Nagaraj Naidu said that India, along with other UN departments, has been working towards developing a mobile tech platform, Unite Aware, that helps increase situational awareness. Use of field-focused, reliable and cost-effective new technologies in peacekeeping operations that are driven by practical needs of end users on the ground is the need of the hour. I'm happy to announce the Council that India, in partnership with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the Department of Operations Support, has been working towards developing a mobile tech platform, the Unite Aware, 
that helps increase situational awareness and provides terrain-related information to peacekeepers. We have already contributed $1.64 million towards this project and hope to launch it during our August presidency later this year. India as a leading contributor to UN peacekeeping operations has also paid the price for peacekeeping in terms of casualties. Hence, in the UN Security Council, India has given a few suggestions to strengthen peacekeeping, which involve pointing out that peacekeeping missions cannot be a long-term response to what are fundamentally political problems. The Security Council now needs to authorize carefully thought-out mandates to peacekeepers in close consultation with group contributing countries since the protection of peacekeepers is as important as the protection of civilians. Let's move to Bangladesh where threats of Islamic extremism are a symptom of deeper social and political problems. In recent months, various hotline Islamist groups in the Muslim-majority country have chosen actions of very violent and belligerent nature. Hateful speeches of many Islamic preachers in the country are inciting violence and chaos. Recently, Bangladesh police arrested one of the country's most popular Islamist preachers on charges of inciting militants, a report. Amir Hamza who is in his 30s, is one of a new generation of Islamist preachers whose firebrand speeches draw huge crowds in Bangladesh. In the Muslim-majority country, his YouTube video speeches get millions of views. However, this Islamist preacher has been arrested recently on charges of inciting militants in Bangladesh. Investigators had found videos of Hamza's speeches in the mobile phone of a suspect detained this month over an alleged plot to attack Bangladesh's parliament. According to Bangladesh police, Hamza was spreading misleading messages about issues of Islam. A Dhaka court recently allowed police to take Islamic preacher in their custody for interrogation in a case for spreading extremism in the name of religion. Amir Hamza is the latest high-profile Islamist to be held since March, when violent protests by hardliners against growing India-Bangladesh ties killed several people. With regards to the arrest of the individual concerned, I have full faith and trust in the law enforcement agencies and the judicial makeup of Bangladesh. And I think that the country and its leadership is taking the appropriate steps to rein in those elements who use, you know, to uh, religion as a tool to propagate their agenda of hate. And they also instigate a lot of violence and destruction of life and other, you know, resources of the country and the public. So, um, I'm sure that the law will take its own course. In 2019, Mizanur Rahmani Azhari, another prominent preacher, fled the country over fears he would be prosecuted for his remarks. In today's Bangladesh, these Islamists are aspiring to shape society according to their interpretation of what constitutes pure Islam. The radical preachers, many funded by Saudi Arabia, attempt to change the religious character of Islam in Bangladesh, eroding its secular culture, even the constitutional concept that guarantees the separation of religion and the state. With secular political parties like the Awami League forced to depend on the support of Islamists during the parliamentary and local body elections, it will take an extremely strong resolve on the part of progressive forces to prevent the country from being overrun by Islamists and their ideology. One thing we'll have to keep in mind is that there was always a portion of the society of the then East Pakistan in prior to 1971 who collaborated with uh, the Pakistani establishment and they were hand in glove, you know, with other uh, religious extremists who propagated this uh, culture of hate and imposition of uh, a foreign language and a culture, you know, on the Bengali people. So this 
section of society has probably still carried on and lingered on and these are the what we see are the reminiscences of uh, those uh, elements back from 1971 so obviously it is an erosion definitely in the uh, liberal values in which bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman laid the foundation stones of the republic of bangladesh the growing traction of violent extremist ideology in bangladesh poses a serious security challenge in the subcontinent current counter terrorism efforts in bangladesh have largely focused on the use of blunt force and suppression of political opposition instead of attempting to tackle the root causes and processes of radicalization dhaka remains rooted in a posture of denial regarding the activities of terror groups on its territory to counter terrorism bangladesh needs to seriously solve its home grown violence instigated by interference of pakistani secret agencies prime minister sheikh hasina's government should reinforce the capability of its law enforcement agencies and build a political consensus against the threats posed by islamic radical outfits In the wake of a serious crackdown by the law enforcement agencies against the hawala operators, Pakistan-based agencies use LOC route to send narcotics to fund the terrorism and unrest in the valley. Since early 2019, when the cross-LOC trade was shut down, narco trade has become the exclusive route to finance terrorism and unrest in Kashmir. Recently, Jammu and Kashmir police busted a Pakistan-sponsored narco terror module in Kupwara district. Jammu and Kashmir police recently busted a Pakistan-sponsored narco terror module in Kupwara district and seized heroin worth rupees 50 crore. During the operation, a militant associate identified as Musajir Ahmed Lone, a resident of Karenbala, area of the North Kashmir district, was also arrested. The module was in close connection with Pakistan-based terrorist handles and was involved in drug trade and financially assisting active terrorists in the valley. These recoveries once again expose the interconnection between drug dealers and terrorists. Moreover, this narco terror module was working for militants to strengthen their activities in the Kashmir Valley and was misguiding and motivating the local youth of the valley to join militant ranks. Kupwara police ne ड्रग्स और आतंकवादी के खिलाफ अपने लड़ाई में आज और एक पाकिस्तान स्पॉन्सर्ड नार्को टेरर मॉडल को बस्ट किया इस ऑपरेशन में मुजसर अहमद लोन के नाम पे एक टेररिस्ट एसोसिएट को भी गिरफ्तार किया उसका कब्जा से आठ के जी हेरोइन जिसकी मार्केट वैल्यू लगभग पचास करोड़ होगा बरामद किया गया ऑन स्पेसिफिक इनपुट्स दो तीन हफ्ते से हमारा टीम्स इस मॉडल के पीछे फॉलो कर रहे बहुत कई जगह तलाशी भी किया लेकिन फाइनली कल शाम पे इस मॉडल को पकड़ लिया ए मुजसर अहमद लोन और उसका ग्रुप पाकिस्तान हैंडलर्स के साथ संपर्क में है To keep the terror machine running, Pakistan has been using narcotics as a major financing tool in Kashmir. While it has been pushing trained terrorists into Kashmir and also deadly arms and ammunition besides fake currency narcotics are being pumped into kashmir to reach indian markets like punjab delhi mumbai to generate money for terror operations and recruitment as per the data available with jnk police in 2020 alone 36.08 kilograms of pure heroin and 49.7 kilograms of brown sugar were recovered from different parts of the valley while indian security forces have been battling the trained terrorists and have virtually broken the backbone of the network narco terrorism is emerging as one of the biggest challenges the nexus between narcotics and terrorism in kashmir seems to have a plausible reason for its growth since pakistan backed terror operatives in the valley have a ready made network over ground workers in border areas who have been acting as couriers of arms ammunition and fake currency in the recent past narcotics have been the primary source of funding terrorism uh in kashmir for a very long time and in fact nar- uh, narcotics have been traditionally uh, a very major source of revenue for terrorists all over the world uh in kashmir of course it has many levels 
uh, I have a lot of friends who, uh, you know, used to be stone pelters, who used to be incentivized into stone pelting uh, through supply of uh, heroin and other highly addictive drugs. So it actually acts as a very, very potent device where you uh, essentially run a drug cartel to create public unrest and then use the sales from it to finance uh, terrorism and weapons procurement. And when, uh, uh, you know, uh, you want to recruit, you use the hook of being a drug supplier to recruit. It is a particularly insidious business. It has been documented in Kashmir over uh, several decades now. And it is one of the most um, uh, underreported stories that there is. It's truly a uh, national security threat of monumental proportions. Through its relationship with the Taliban, jihadi elements and Islamic extremists, on one hand, and international terrorists and the narcotics traitors on the other, Pakistan poses a threat not only to India but to regional stability. In a sophisticated world where the other countries are looking forward to establishing peace, harmony and developing new technologies for the advancement of the world settlement, Pakistan's state policy of terrorism is causing violence and is creating an environment of distrust in the world. The Tehrik e Labaik Pakistan is one of the most successful far-right groups in Pakistan, which draws its inspiration from Mumtaz Qadri, the fanatic responsible for killing Punjab governor Salman Taseer in 2011 for criticizing the country's blasphemy law. A recent report by Inside Over website said, said amid U.S. group withdrawal from Afghanistan, TLP is emerging as next big global terrorist threat. The past years of U.S. occupation of Afghanistan, as well as various geopolitical changes, may mean that Pakistani intelligence and army may have to find another proxy to continue terrorist activities. The Tehrik e Labbaik Pakistan is one such candidate. It has challenged the Pakistan state rate in the past few weeks by indulging in rampant violence and arson. Amid U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, Tehrik e Labbaik Pakistan or TLP has emerged as a potential next big threat to the world after the Taliban. Was Shinoy, a scholar of Europe-India relations, writes this for Inside Over. Inside Over is a website focusing on international analysis and reporting. According to Shinoy, the Pakistan army strongly supports Tehrik e Labbaik Pakistan given its challenges controlling the Taliban and is encouraging the development of the TLP as a proxy. Recently, this radical group had demanded the expulsion of the French ambassador over a cartoon of Prophet Muhammad published in France. Subsequently, week-long violent protests by TLP forced the Imran Khan government to negotiate with it. Pakistan اور طریقے لبیک کے درمیان طویل مذاکرات کے بعد یہ بات طے پا گئی ہے کہ ہم آج قومی اسمبلی میں فرانسیسی سفیر کی ملک بدری کی قرارداد پیش کریں گے اور طریقے لبیک سارے ملک سے جس میں کہ خاص طور پر مسجد رحمت اللہ العالمین سے بھی دھرنے کو ختم کیا جائے گا اور بات چیت اور مذاکرات کا سلسلہ آگے بڑھایا جائے گا اور جن لوگوں کے خلاف مقدمات درج ہیں سمیت فورتھ شیڈیول کے ان کا بھی اخراج کیا جائے گا ٹی ایل پی اوریجنیٹڈ فرام دی امبریلا آف ریلیجس پارٹیز کال تحریک البیک یا رسول اللہ ڈیمانڈنگ دا ریلیز آف ممتاز قادری ہو گن ڈاؤن پنجاب گورنر سلمان تصیر ان ٹوینٹی الیون دس ریڈیکل آؤٹ فٹ از دا فلیگ بیئر آف دا بلیس فیم ایشو demanding death for blasphemers. Political analysts suggest that Pakistan's security establishment allegedly helped launch the TLP to break the vote bank of the ruling party in Punjab. Whatever the case might be, it is a fact that TLP is now a political force in Pakistan and Punjab with considerable street power. In the case of Pakistan, the frustration of the people, especially the disempowered youth, has been channelized through religious sentiments which works as a catalyst and as a result the TLP wins politically. And in Pakistan, Sindhi, Baloch, Muhajir, Pakhtun, 
मर रहा है हजारों की तादाद में मिसिंग पर्सन है उस पाकिस्तान में तहरीक लब्बे पाकिस्तान जिसने के स्टेट के रिट को चैलेंज किया था जिसने पुलिस वालों को अगवा किया था जिसने पुलिस वालों को मारा था जिसने आम आदमी की जिंदगी अजीरन कर दी पब्लिक एंड प्राइवेट प्रॉपर्टी तबाह की उस तहरीक के लब्बे पाकिस्तान के तमाम कारकुनों को छोड़ दिया गया साद रिजवी को छोड़ दिया गया उस तहरीक के लब्बे पाकिस्तान जिसको के फेडरल कैबिनेट ने रेजोल्यूशन के जरिए बैन किया था उसको उसके ऊपर से आप बैन भी हटा रहे हैं और सारे केसेस भी खत्म कर रहे हैं ये आर्मी के लोग हैं इनके खिलाफ इनको सरेंडर करना ही पड़ेगा और ये आर्मी के इशारे पे सारी चीजें चल रही हैं इमरान खान ऑलरेडी एक बूट चाट पॉलिटिशियन है जो कि आर्मी के कदमों में बैठा हुआ है और उनके कदमों में लौटता रहता है और उनकी हर बात मान रहा है लेकिन इसको मुस्तकिल प्रेशर में रखा है इन द शोर्ट पीरियड ऑफ इट्स एग्जिस्टेंस TLP has gained heft and is now taking the state head on leading to a situation that is in some ways worse than what even neighboring Afghanistan is going through after 3 decades of war Afghanistan is barely a state Pakistan is at least on the outside but the current collapse of order with even prime minister Imran Khan publicly excusing action against Tehreek e Labbaik is a symptom of severe trouble within a nuclear weapon state And with that we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa@anin.com. This is Karim Zumik signing off on behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.